Shout out to this video's sponsor, PostHog, the all-in-one suite for product tools. Make sure you tell them Theo sent you if you sign up. I want to be very clear, they've had no say on anything I say. They didn't even tell me to cover this. I just saw the blog post and I wanted to share it with y'all and it fits under our current sponsor agreement, so I'm just rolling with it. They've had no creative input whatsoever. This is just me talking about this thing because I thought it was interesting and I'll do my best to get my honest takes, but do know PostHog paid for me to make content about them and this is part of that deal. Anyways, how to safely test in production and why you should. You might start seeing why I'm aligned with them so much. At PostHog, we test in production. There are many misconceptions about doing this. It does not mean things like, we commit to main every time we make a change. We push to main a lot though. Doesn't mean that we randomly click around once the code releases to make sure it works. Okay, I kinda do that. And it doesn't mean that we ship code into prod without testing it. It might mean that though, I'm curious. We'll, we'll see as we go. Testing in production successfully is a multi-step process. And this post goes over what it is, why we do it, and most importantly, how to do it well. So what is testing in production, at least as they describe it? Testing in production checks that new code works with real infrastructure and data, rather than local machines or staging servers with synthetic data. Very important. You'll never actually know if your code works if it's not running in production how you expect it to. Up until that point, everything is theoretical. Even Prime and I agree on this, where mock data and staging isn't a real test. It's a test that everything works how you think it should work, but not that it actually works how you expect it to work. Different things. Code doing what it says and code doing what you want does not necessarily line up. Yeah, everyone's favorite. Production, my code working locally. A+. Plus. Testing in production brings to light problems with code that isn't surfaced by local testing. This enables you to discover issues and fail small before problems impact the user experience or become outages. I like the terminology fail small. This is a concept I talk a lot about. I describe it in a slightly different position, but same general goal of build safety nets, not guardrails. Systems that are meant to catch you before you make a mistake are inherently bad to rely on because mistakes will happen no matter what. The most important thing is you have a place where the person lands when they make that mistake. It's less about how likely is a mistake and more about how do we recover when a mistake happens. One of the keys to that is making sure those mistakes are as small as possible so recovery is easier. And it seems like that's a focus for them here. So let's take a look at their types of production testing. Testing in production includes techniques like real user monitoring, which is tracking apps, query, and site performance, as well as error rates and logs, load spike and soak testing, which includes checking code for issues and performance when under a high volume or stress load. Then there's shadowing, mirroring, and dark launching, all things that I've played with, the idea of taking clones of the production database so you can play with things yourself by evaluating new code with duplicated or mirrored production data that's hidden or separated fully from users. Something we would do at Twitch is for certain internal services that had really crazy expectations, we would do a clone of the production database every two to three weeks and then use that as our testing database with all of the user identifiable data like obfuscated by like randomly generating over it. It was a pretty good strategy to make sure we had the same amount of data and the same type of data without actually using the production database. So that was production testing as they're describing it here. Even though the data we were using wasn't literally production at the moment, it was a clone of production later on. Then there's integration testing, which is checking services, features, and infrastructure to make sure that they're working together once they're deployed. Alerts are important too, where you notify the relevant people when issues and errors occur. This is one of the most important parts, and again, falls under the safety nets thing, where if you actually have issues, it's important that you have a way to fix them quickly, because you're going to have issues no matter how good your process is. Usage tracking is another really important piece, to undercover how users are actually using the product, using analytics, session replays, as well as A-B testing. Great way to test new stuff too, if you're A-B testing a new feature to see who it is and isn't working for. Also, feedback and surveys. Surveys are criminally underrated. There is so much stuff that you think you're getting in your silly little analytics databases. You might be missing the whole point. You might actually have no idea why users are actually doing the things they're doing or using the things they're using. Very important to find ways to talk to them and surveys are a great way to do that. So when should you not test in production? Testing in production comes with risks. Tests fail and failures in production can cause issues for real users if you're not careful. Because of this, testing in production's practicality depends on the following. The size of the business, the potential negative impact of the change, and the speed to identify and resolve issues. I agree with parts of this, specifically the speed to identify and resolve issues. Yes, this should be top of mind always, no matter how big you or your company or your code base are. It should be very, very fast to fix an issue when one is identified, be it an automatic rollback button, be it really fast deployments and build times, be it good processes of identifying when a user has an issue, be it you roll out in small chunks and when you see a significant group of people in one of these chunks having an issue, being able to 
walk back whatever caused them to have that issue in the first place. Being able to identify these things is essential. And I don't think it matters how big your business is if you already have a good pipeline for identifying and resolving the issues. So I don't love this point. I will say that the size of your business makes it more likely these problems are harder to solve. But if you solve the potential negative impact part where you have a reasonable size of impact for these failures, as well as the ability to identify and fix them if they happen, the size of the business stops mattering. I feel like this is just put here to satisfy the people who say, well, this only works for startups so they can smile and feel good about themselves as they go back to like poorly re-optimizing a service for the 15th time that nobody wants to maintain. Anyways, for example, testing a UI change to a small web app with feature flags is likely safe to do in production. The impact is small and any issues get mitigated quickly. Testing an algorithm update on a massive automated financial trading product with slow deployments is better to do away from prod. So why can't I test a UI change on a big web app with feature flags? Why is that not safe in production? Do you have any idea how many features are being tested via feature flags on big, big, big applications right now? There's a whole like person whose brand was finding these feature flags and activating features so early that they were leaks. Her name's Jane Wong. She's a good friend. And she ended up getting hired to work over at Facebook, now helping build Instagram and threads because she was so good at finding features that now it's her job to help build them. This is just reality and we're fine with it because most big companies even are okay with the fact that feature flags allow them to find stuff much more effectively. And I think that's awesome. But yes, that, that's my one disagreement here is I don't think size of the business matters as much as this implies. And I don't like using small versus massive here because you could have a massive web app with feature flags and you could have a small automated financial trading product and this would still be true. Size is not the differentiator here. So why do we test in production? At post hoc, we test in broad. We have three main reasons for doing this. I want to call one thing out before we actually read this section because I think I didn't before and it's really important. Post hoc isn't your usual analytics as a service provider. Post hoc is on GitHub because they're fully open source. You can self-host all of what post hoc's built relatively trivially. You got a bunch of scripts and Docker images and things here, but post hoc is self-hostable and all of the features, all of the things that they've built are here in their open source build, which means you can also see a lot of the things people are adding over time. You can just check the pull requests and see what the team is changing to get a good idea of what they're working on, which is fascinating. It's a really good way to get an idea of like what their plans are going forward. And it means that if they're testing new things, it's hard for them to hide it. It's pretty hard for post hog to hide a new feature that they're working on the same way it's hard for Next.js to hide a new feature they're working on. You can just read the code. It's one of the costs of open source. It's also one of the benefits. And it means some of the risk here of testing new things, potentially causing the things to leak is less of a big deal because it's going to leak anyways. It's already in their GitHub. You know, asking about the license. This looks like standard MIT. Yep. This is uh, MIT. There you go. So now that we know it's open source and it's pretty hard for them to hide things, that immediately scratches out one of the reasons they wouldn't do this. So let's see the reasons that they do. The first one is that production is the real world. Yeah. The implication here is that everything that isn't production isn't the real world. And I think that's an important thing to note here. Ultimately, we want the code we write and the features that we build to work in reality. We try to make the development environment as close to prod as possible, but it can never be a complete match and there is diminishing returns to trying. Yep. Oh, I love their little guy. I think his name's Max. He's adorable. They even made one of me as Max, which is really cute. But yeah, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. What a quote. That's actually a phenomenal quote. I like that a lot. Anyways, some checks aren't even possible outside of production. For example, we handle massive amounts of data and we use big machines to process and query it. Replicating this locally is expensive and unsustainable. Yep. In production, we learn how new code and features interact with production data and infrastructure. There are often bugs or issues missed locally that get solved by doing this. As the code release widens, we also get feedback and real usage data from teammates as well as beta testers. This is another big part here is for this stuff to work, dog fooding is essential. Oh, look, they call that out right there. I'll say from my experience, when I was working on things like the dashboard and Twitch studio, when I worked at Twitch, I got a lot better at fixing things when I started using them. And one of the most controversial things I did when I was working on Twitch studio, we were actually doing a rewrite of the whole like UI layer and making it a drag and drop customizable interface. And I was struggling so hard to get anyone at the company, especially within that team and org to give me feedback on the work I was doing on a team I had just joined. It was like me and the other engineer kind of siloed off. So I got my manager to approve me rolling out all of the work we had done under a feature flag that was off for all users except for staff who it was on for. And the moment I did that, we got a fucking torrential like fire hose of feedback from all the employees who were working on and using the Twitch studio and the dashboard. Because when they had to opt out of 
our new way of doing it. Suddenly they had a reason to take a look and give feedback. Dog fooding is essential. And the only reason that worked is those people were using the tools and product so they could see the thing we were changing. And then they saw it had changed, liked it or didn't like it, often didn't like it. And then bring us that feedback and we could go fix it. But if you don't have dog fooding culture and the ability to turn something on for employees so they'll bring you feedback, the likelihood you find those types of issues ahead of time is significantly lower. Dog fooding and collaboration. We are our own best customers at Posthog. Many of the features we develop are the ones most useful to us. Testing in prod enables us to use the features we develop before releasing them, also known as dog fooding. For example, we use the early access management feature to manage the beta of early access management. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. This enables us both to test the feature as well as have the structure in place to roll it out to users. By solving issues that arose in the beta, we released a more polished final feature to all of the users that ended up with it. Really cool. Dogfooding also enables our team to collaborate in production. Instead of managing and jumping between in-progress branches, they ship to production and work off of that. When someone requests feedback for a new feature, they simply add their teammate to the feature flag. Once ready, this feature flag transitions to a way to do phase rollouts. Again, really cool. And basically every feature flag system I've seen works like this. You don't have to use Postlog for it, although theirs is insanely cheap, worth considering. You can use a feature flag initially as a way to say, oh, this group of three people should have access and nobody else should. And then when the feature is done and you're ready to roll it out, you can switch it over to be a rollout where you give it to 1% of users, then 5%, then 50%, then 100%, just to make sure that any metrics changes that happen between the groups are accounted for and the service isn't totally broken with the changes. So point three, Interesting. This is very interesting. The third point is that they have no need to maintain a staging environment when they test in production. Mark, I hope you're listening. This is going to be an interesting one for us. A staging environment is a smaller replica of the production environment where code and features get tested on synthetic data before going to production. By testing in production, we skip this and drop the maintenance needed. We once had a demo environment, but we decided to shut it down. Although it was a place where we could test outside of prod, like a staging environment, a lot of maintenance went into it. It broke and it had bugs that were different from production. Solving them was an effort better used elsewhere. We shifted efforts to improving onboarding, making it faster to get started on a new project. We've done some crazy stuff for this at Ping for upload thing. One of the things we wanted to have set up is the ability for our testing environments to trigger callbacks through our weird S3 to Lambda to service like pipe. But the only way we could do that was having a way for us to locally tunnel the S3 callback to us. So what Market ended up creating was a Cloudflare proxy layer that would always be hit by staging S3 buckets that would see all of the users who are currently connected through the tunnel and forward any S3 messages in dev to all of those users based on an ID. Utter chaos, and it took them days to do, but it works great. It's a huge part of why we're able to have a staging environment when we're doing dev work locally. But the fact that he had to do all of that because we're trying to make better testing environments and better dev environments is insane. And if we could just skip that and have prod be our testing in a safe fashion, it would be worth considering, if not rushing out to do. Very fair points all around. At best, testing in a staging environment is a bit like confirmation bias. It works and breaks in all the ways you expect it to, but what you care about is actually what's unexpected. Reality is much different. This is again that same point that I was saying Prime makes where your tests are testing what you think the code should do, not how the code will actually do it. And if you're not using integration tests, you're just doing unit tests. You're only testing what you're expecting. You're not testing what you're not expecting. That's the whole problem. So how do we actually do this? How do we test in production? Well, how do they in particular? Testing in prod is detrimental if it leads to more issues than it solves. To test in production safely, you need a way to roll out, monitor, and roll back tests effectively. For us at Posthog, it happens largely in two stages, deployment and release. I like calling these separately because they are separate. They also call it local tests as important. They run front-end unit tests, visual regression tests, back-end tests, and end-to-end -end tests locally, as well as on new pull requests. They ensure merged code doesn't cause bugs, regressions, and degradations. I have to go check quick because they said end-to-end -end tests and front-end tests locally. I'm scared. I really hope we're not about to see what I'm scared we might see. You guys know what I'm searching for? <laughs> no. <laughs> what I would give for the world to move on from pre-commit hooks. I already have a video about how terrible pre-commit hooks are. I'll never recommend them for anything. I highly recommend you don't do them. I'm sure they're doing some in some cool ways. Maybe they're just lint. Maybe they're running them background in a cool, fast way. But the idea of blocking my developers making a commit on my opinions that I've encoded in my repo makes me want to pull my hair out one strand at a time. Do not do this. I love you guys, Post Hog. Do not do this. If you guys disagree, hit me up. I'm down to chat. But all Husky does is piss off good engineers. 
you're already running this stuff inside of your repo anyways. You don't need to run on your machine as well. So apparently they're just using Husky for linting. Less bad. Still hate it, but less bad. But like, yeah, check out my video about pre-commit hooks. I don't want this to sidetrack for that because it will literally be an hour long video of me just bitching about them more. I hate them. Any, I, I've pointed Husky at dev null on my machine, so nothing can ever force it to run. Let me know in my pull request that my code is wrong. Don't prevent me from committing because you don't like the way I did my code. <sighs> Anyways, so how do they actually do their tests? Testing once deployed. Once writing code and passing tests, it gets deployed in production. This doesn't mean all the users are using it. We separate deployments from release. Again, very important. Releasing something shouldn't mean all users have it. It should mean the code is there for you to activate for whichever users should or shouldn't have it. To do this, we rely on feature flags. They enable us to control a feature's rollout. Often feature flags start only rolled out to the developer responsible for the change. I've honestly been surprised how many devs don't use feature flags, especially for like medium projects. I find it something I add to, to most stuff. And there's a lot of different ways you can add it. One of the ways I do it a lot, and I actually do this in my tutorial that hopefully will be out by the time this video is, if I go to my gallery app from said tutorial, you can see in here, I have a user permissions field, can upload true. This is a very minimal way to enable that feature where I have the key values here, true or false, if they should or shouldn't be enabled. And now I've built my own feature flags. There's a lot of better ways to do this though. There's wonderful services like obviously post hog There's also launched darkly, which is pretty popular. Darkly's pretty solid overall. I found it to be a little bit heavy, but it's become an industry standard really quick. There's also growth book, which is again, fully open source, really cool stuff. They're actually part of my Y Combinator batch and I've been chatting with them for a while. Great crew of people, fully open source feature flags, easy to self-host, all based out of a JSON blob. Pretty trivial to set up and also very cheap compared to other options. That said, post hog is my preference. They're what I've been leaning on more and more lately. Regardless, you have lots of options to consider for feature flags. Just be careful with launch darkly's pricing. Postdoc gives an example of how they handle their query performance changes. Our team makes many improvements to query performance. We use production data and machines to load test it with real queries. We do this either in our production app or through Grafana. We also keep an eye on error monitoring to ensure the new code hasn't caused any exceptions. But for others, this is where spike, soak, shadowing, mirroring, and integration tests all happen. Yes, much more traditional, but I like the way they're doing things differently here. And yes, you Grafana. Testing once released. Once the production tests related to deployment pass, we expand the release. This usually means rolling out the feature flag further and getting more users to try it. This is where you use the rest of the production testing techniques. They include usage analytics, session replays, monitoring, feedback, and surveys. This goes along with error tracking as well as bug reports. By testing in production, we uncover issues and get feedback fast. This is its major benefit. For teams wanting to get to the heart of the issue faster and ship more, testing in production might be right for you. One more piece they didn't call out here, and I'm actually surprised they didn't, is big PRs. I already did a video about big pull requests. I highly recommend checking it out if this part's interesting to you. The TLDR is that Graphite, who, yes, is another channel sponsor, has been fighting this war against giant pull requests for a while. And one of the main keys for doing this is feature flags, because you can merge code much more early. You don't have to wait till every part of the feature is done until you merge. You can just merge the part that's done, keep it under a feature flag, and it's fine. It lets you move significantly faster, because now every change is reviewable in its own chunk. You don't have to worry about massive chains of conflicts and all the weird approval processes if every chunk along the way gets merged by itself and hidden under a feature flag to prevent the problems from hitting users. It's so common for these massive PRs to build up over time. And as silly as it sounds that testing in production is kind of the solution, it really is. Regardless, you get the idea. Once again, huge shout out to PostHog for covering this and letting me make a video about it. I'm really loving the product and I'm pumped to have them as a channel sponsor. And until next time, let me know how your testing in production goes.